Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 214 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick. This is the second of a two part interview with bartender, entrepreneur, and milk punch expert, Eamon Rocky. He is the creator of Rocky's Botanical Liqueur, and if you haven't listened to part one of this interview, you're missing out on a bunch of important background as well as other fun stuff like our featured cocktail, the Rocky's Spritz. If you did tune in last week, you know that we deviously left you on a cliffhanger where Eamon was about to reveal his secret to making milk punch without the stress of filtering and straining until you're blue in the face. We'll start off here by giving you the goods that we so cruelly dangled last time around, and we'll continue with an awesome tasting and discussion centered around Eamon's delicious, painstakingly formulated, and surprisingly affordable botanical liqueur. You can pick up a bottle yourself by heading to rockiesliqueur.com and hitting their store finder, but for now, please sit back, relax, and enjoy the conclusion of this in-depth romp through the curd-filled wonderland we call Milk Punch. If we're not using cheesecloth and we're not using coffee filters, what is the simple way to uh, avoid those and and, uh, keep our yields a little bit higher? The misconception about clarified milk punch is that your curds are the enemy and that you should do whatever you can to get rid of them. The curds are your only friend when you make milk punch. And what I mean by that is that uh, uh, you're describing the process that almost every bartender immediately goes for when they make it. And I'm always just so confused as to why. I think there's probably some ding-dongs that put videos on YouTube showing an incorrect process and and I'm so sorry that that is the case, but that is not how you make milk punch, at least not in the most effective way. And and quite simply, the way you make milk punch well is you actually use a very porous filter. You don't want a tight filter. You want the loosest filter possible. And what I what I tell people is, you know, use a tablecloth, a cotton tablecloth. Use an inside out bed sheet or or sorry a pillowcase. Inside out pillowcase is just about the best clarification filter you can get. And the reason is, the reason is because they don't stop the flow of liquid at all. But you know what they do stop is the curds. And so what happens is you pour your uh, not particularly attractive initial break, initial break of the punch with all the curds floating around in it. You pour it whole, all of it, all of it into, let's say, the, the, the pillowcase inside out. And what happens is all the curds will fall onto the sides, the insides of the of the pillowcase, and they clog the very loose weave of the cloth. That means that the curds are actually doing the work for you. You're not clarifying the punch. You shouldn't be clarifying the punch through various levels of, of tighter and tighter micron filters like chinois, cheesecloth, you know, uh, coffee filter, blah, blah, blah. You should just be clarifying it through the curds. And so as you pour all that liquid into the pillowcase and all the curds start to group together and form a protein matrix, that's exactly what it is. Whether you're doing gelatin clarification, agar clarification, casein clarification, doesn't matter. It's the same thing, right? It's the same thing. Um, So all of these curds are falling into uh, the shape along the inside of the pillowcase. And as they really take form and they they knit together to form that matrix, you simply take the the punch and the liquid that's come through and you pour it gently back on top. And you let that cycle go over and over and over and over and over until all of the casein, all those curds have adhered to each other and and formed their own organic, natural, single filter. And if you just repeat that cycle, you will get a clear punch and it will be beautiful and you will maximize your yield because you're not losing any to the cheesecloth, to the coffee filter, to spilling it, whatever, right? You're, You're just, you're allowing the same amount of liquid 
to start the process and the same amount of liquid to stop. The only thing you should be losing is the, is the volume and weight of the casein itself, which you don't want anyway. Right. And it sounds, so it sounds like if you wanted to replicate this at home, you would simply need a couple of large, like, like a brewer's bucket or so, you know, or a couple of large pots, for example, and then Absolutely. a pillowcase and then something that you can use to hang that pillowcase above the pot. Right. Absolutely. Right. A, a frame of some sort, you know, I've used the backs. You'd be surprised what I've used to, to do this stuff at home. You know, I've, I've used two crutches that were tied to chairs, you know, cause the crutches have those mm -hmm. like sort of uh, U shaped tops. I've used the backs of bar stools, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, uh, I use twine or a zip tie to, to secure, you know, you just need to hang it from something, you know what I'm saying? And, and once you get that, you're good. I could see it even working if you were able to put some secure holes or even, you know, if you're crafty, some grommets into, you know, that pillowcase where you could even use like if you you're familiar with those plastic hangers that have the little uh, inset hooks yeah. for the women's dress straps, like you could yeah. hook the on the on those uh, those little insets there and just hang that hanger right above your bucket over over something. So it seems like it's a process that's relatively easy to replicate. So thank you for that. The last <laughs> technical question I have when as we're extracting this booze from this milk punch you know you said something that I that really set something off in my mind because if you're talking about what spirits have in common with teas it's like well in the aged in the case of aged spirits tannins Absolutely. right so you're taking if you're taking out a spirit well you're losing some tannins great you're going to dope the tea the over extracted tea into the process, the tannins like raindrops need, you know, a little speck of something to form around those tannins are going to give the, you know, the protein something to kind of latch onto. So that makes sense to me. Um, now when you get this virgin quote unquote milk punch, how long did that usually stay good? I mean, it's got some sugar working for it and it's got some acid working for it. So I imagine it had a decent shelf life, but like in a walk-in or in a personal refrigerator um, at a you know good refrigeration level, how long roughly were you able to keep that base viable? So uh, the acid for sure will help to preserve it. And obviously cold, you know, keeping it chilled uh, and in an airtight container, uh, will help a lot, but uh, the sugar actually works against it because it is food for microbes. You know, it's food, mm. food for yeast, food for anything that's in there and that gets in there, and it will get in there, right? So right. you will you will absolutely uh, see fermentation happen from the sugar and from the whey protein that is still present in a, a standard clarified milk punch, right? So there's plenty of things to eat in it that will spur fermentation. What I will say is really cool and fun is whenever you do that on purpose and you take a clarified punch and intentionally like maybe crown cap it, you know, like you would if you were a beer, a beer producer or a brewer. Um, and I think a lot of bars are doing bottled cocktails now. So if you have a crown cap, putting clarified uh, non-alcoholic or low alcohol milk punch into a bottle and, and sealing it, you will get fermentation and natural, natural uh, effervescence from it. And it will foam like crazy because of the whey protein. So the way that I got around that is I would uh, take individual portions of the uh, non-alcoholic clarified punch and I would freeze them in, in bags. And then to order, we would just take the bag and we'd throw it into our little immersion circulator that we had behind the bar. It would melt within a minute and then we would add whatever booze we wanted to and off to the races. Uh, to be clear, uh, because because I, I don't want to paint an inaccurate picture, usually if we were doing a, a, a punch for the menu and that we knew people were going to add their own choice of spirit to, we would stabilize that punch with a little bit of vodka, just a little bit, so sure. that we, we were able to keep it. And we sold so many of them uh, on a nightly basis, on a weekly basis, that uh, we, we could stabilize it with a little bit of, of spirit and feel good about adding anything else on top of it, right? To order uh, that we would extend the shelf life to a week, week and a half or so. And it was a non-issue, especially when kept cold. But we would always keep on reserve at least, I don't know, a dozen or so portions of a frozen, completely virgin clarified punch for anybody who did want a truly virgin uh, punch. Sure. And, and that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's so many opportunities, right? Uh, a no ABV application, as you mentioned, the champagne method milk punch where yeah. you're sitting there actually encouraging the fermentation. It sounds like there's not enough sugar, which actually makes sense. There's certainly not enough sugar in a milk punch right. to 
you know, with to get the bricks up to a point where fermentation will be a little bit inhibited. So that makes a lot of sense, man. I feel like I've just like gone through a college level milk punch crash course here. Like I thought I, I thought I'd done my, my due diligence, but this is just, this is mind blowing. So, so we're at a point where we're actually ready to stick this in a bottle. And yeah. what what became you know Rocky's milk punch and then Rocky's botanical liqueur is that hyper flexible base where you're saying like okay, like milk punch is not a recipe. Milk punch is an approach to flavor. And so, how did people receive that at first? I mean, a, milk punch was certainly popular within small groups of people, but how was Rocky's initially received, and and what was it like launching that uh, in a bottle for the first time? It was really interesting. You know, um, I I spent let's see from two thousand eight until twenty sixteen. Yeah, uh, so eight years I spent making it every week and um and a, a lot a lot of a lot of milk punch was made in in various forms and you know um i'll, gi I'll give an example of something that um is slightly off off the beaten path or off the track that we're walking on uh and then bring it home so milk punch and milk clarifications typically are used to make a a recipe or produce a drink and you you have that, you know, you make it with, let's say, mezcal and hibiscus and, uh, I don't know, jalapeno and lime and you add a little bit of cinnamon and it's delicious. We love it. It's in a bottle. It's pink. High five, right? That's, that's awesome. Um, but say to yourself, what else can this technique give us? And, and I, I referenced it a minute ago with regard to uh, the the carbonation, the natural carbonation of a punch, uh, it will foam a lot because the whey protein just naturally foams. That's 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 something it does on its own, right? Um, so I said to myself at at uh, the restaurant with the team, I was like, we are using eggs in a bunch of cocktails to make foamy cocktails, pisco sour, so on and so forth, right? Um, this aquafaba thing I think is really cool and interesting, but cracking open a can of chickpeas and pouring the liquid into a bottle. It doesn't really feel like us. Um, there's nothing against it. I'm not criticizing it. I've used it many, many times uh, in, in other bar programs. But I was like, if we're going to do something uh, besides egg white to foam cocktails, let's think of another more more sort of our method of, of going about it. And it occurred to me um, that I'd, I'd recently cracked open a bottle of carbonated clarified milk punch, which, by the way, as it ferments and carbonates, it also clouds. So don't be surprised if you go for a fermented bottle condition, clarified milk punch, and all of a sudden it turns cloudy. It's just the natural way of, of fermentation. Um, but I cracked one open and it exploded kinda, and it foamed all over the place, and there's like suds and they're stable too, right? And so I thought to myself, I bet we can figure out how to use this as a foaming agent in our cocktails. So what we effectively did is we, we made a really, 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 really concentrated only acid, a little bit of tea, not much, and a lot of milk. We performed a clarification that way. And we weren't really worried about whether it was perfectly clear because clarifying something that's that milk rich and that acid rich, it's very difficult. It can't, it's not that it can't be done. It's just, it's very, very, very difficult. So we, we concentrate on, concentrate on getting as much as we could out of it. Um, in terms of particulate, but weren't really concerned about perfect clarity. Because what we did then is we sweetened it, right? We, we figured out the right ratio, we sweetened it, and we used it as our own sour mix, right? Made from fresh lemon and lime, uh, beautiful black tea, uh, which completely clarifies out. You wouldn't even know there's black tea in it. Uh, that tea is just there to lubricate it and provide that bit of tannin for the curds to play with. A lot of milk relative to the recipe, and then we sweetened it exactly uh, to the point. I don't recall if we did exactly simple sweetness or if we did a little bit down. I think we did a little bit lower. Um, but what we had now is a sour, sweet foaming agent that if you use like a quarter ounce in a cocktail, you get beautiful head, beautiful foam on top, and it's stable. You know, you can paint the top of it with Ango. So for me, I'm like, this application is so cool. It is not a milk punch. It is not a milk wash, which I'm kind of 
you know, iffy on just using the word milk wash in general, but that's another conversation. Um, it is, it is not a finished cocktail. This is an application of the technique that we learned from clarif clarified milk punch, but we're using this in margaritas. We're using this in daiquiris. We're using this in gimlets and man, is it good. It is so cool, right? It's not aquafaba. It doesn't have that slight savory quality that you get from chickpeas, which is tasty, but it's there and it's not an egg white, right? So uh, that integration, integrating that technique was so fun and so cool. And I, I'm, I'm bringing that up because when I launched Rockies as a milk punch, a lot of people got really excited about it. Bartenders got excited about it. Some sort of home uh, cocktail enthusiasts got excited about it. But then the, the issue that I encountered was that a lot of bartenders, people I love, you know, people or my friends are like, well, listen, we, we know that, uh, you know, you're kind of the guy who taught our team how to make milk punch, uh, but we're going to make our own now. We don't need Rockies. And and that, that was so frustrating because I intentionally formulated Rockies to be used as a modifier. Why does it matter what the technique uh, uh, was that led to the liquid in the bottle? Why is that important if the utilization of it provides benefit to your cocktail program? You're not going to make Rockies. I'm going to make Rockies. You should make your own delicious uh, iteration of Milk Punch using whatever ingredients you want, right? My goal was to produce a, a modifier in cocktails. And so the reception was universally positive and, and often at best I was met with sort of this, um, I, I make my own, so I don't need this mantra or, um, at worst people who were not interested in learning about something called milk punch. And, and that was, that was a real bummer for me. And, and, uh, in complete transparency, I, I, I said, I can't let this continue to be a hindrance. The product has never changed. The recipe has never changed. But by uh, presenting Rockies as the liqueur that it has always been, I have circumvented and circumnavigated these, these really um, frustrating conversations where people are telling me they don't want to use a perfectly good modifier because it happens to include a phrase that they're familiar with as a cocktail technique. And I always tell people, I'm like, look, you're going to not carry Averna or Remitzotti or Montenegro just because you make your own Amaro. You're not going to carry Nuali Pratt Vermouth or Dolan or Gonzalez Bias Vermouth, all spectacular Vermouths, because you can grab a bottle of Pinot de Chirant and make your own style of Vermouth. That, that for me doesn't make any sense. Um, but it's, it's a monster I feel at least partially responsible for having created. And so I, t I take my fair share of that. Um, but it's, it's just been really important for me to, to continue to emphasize and, and present Rockies as what it is designed to be, as a cocktail modifier to bartenders and as a, uh, a, a delicious, convenient bottle for people who are looking to make drinks at home and can combine whatever spirit they want to with it. Yeah. I think that it's a shame that you had to encounter that <laughs> inevitable yeah. pushback. Um, but it does speak to growth and evolution in the industry. And um, it's not necessarily universally good, right? Good and bad is in the eye of the beholder. Progress is just movement from one place toward another place. Uh, yeah. We don't always get to control that. And, and so it seems like, you know, by being on the cutting edge of Milk Punch, what you were doing is you were years ahead of other folks and being able to construct the method, deconstruct it, find these different applications. I mean, I think your foaming agent application is a wonderful case study in milk punch as process versus milk punch as product, you know? And yes. I, I think, you know, like, of course, like nobody's getting rid of Campari just because, you know, I can find something red and make it bitter and citrusy. It doesn't mean I'm getting rid of Campari and Aperol. So why then does you know, this sort of logic suddenly start applying to milk punch. I agree. Um, bitters are the same thing. You're going to yeah. stop using Angostura bitters. No way. Mm -hmm. No mm -hmm. way you're going to stop using Angostura bitters. It's delicious. And you should also make your own. No problem. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a misapplication of the word. Yes. It's a yes, but instead of a yes and right, right. It's uh, <laughs> it's breaking the fundamental rule of improv and, and creating a, 
handcrafted cocktail menu requires a lot of improvisation. So why are you saying yes, but instead of yes, and? Yep. But I digress on, on the whole improv front. This episode is brought to you by Near Country Provisions. I've been a customer for about a year now, and I can say without hesitation that the delivery of frozen farm fresh meat that I receive from Adam and his team makes me do a little happy dance every month. Not only does Near Country offer grass-fed beef and pasture-raised pork, but they also have an awesome selection of chicken and seafood. And the best part is it's all local and it's all sustainably farmed and harvested. You can customize every order or simply leave the selection in their capable hands like I do. Near Country even offers fun add-ons like bones for soups and stocks, as well as special holiday offerings like turkeys, brisket, and more. If you live in the Mid-Atlantic, that's D.C., Maryland, or Virginia, and you're sick of the same bland selection at the grocery store, or you're looking to drastically improve the quality of the protein in your diet, Near Country Provisions has you covered. Head over to nearcountry.com and enter the code BARCART, all one word, when you sign up for your subscription to receive two free pounds of bacon or ground beef in your first delivery. That's BARCART, B-A-R-C-A-R-T, all one word, at checkout. This is easily one of the biggest quality of life improvements I've made in the last year or two, so I hope you'll give Near Country Provisions a shot and let me know what you think. Now, back to the show. The so let, let's talk about the the flavor profile. When yeah. I when I taste Rocky's botanical liqueur, one of the things that I immediately immediately notice is just like bursting with fruit and green apple. Um, yeah. The tea in a milk punch as we've sort of alluded to here, is often a background player. It's there to serve a purpose instead of to be the loudest note in the symphony. The the T is not doing a solo in this song. The T is just kind of providing, you know, a play, you know, kind of rhythm guitar kind of situation. But the, the, the fruit, can you talk about the fruit profile of this product and how you, how you came to uh, develop that? Absolutely. And you're spot on. So to, First, I'll list the ingredients that I used, and then I will uh, sort of give some background, at least why I think it makes sense to have used them together. Um, So Rockies primarily consists of green apple, pineapple, uh, lemon, lime, and orange. Those are the fruit components, both sweet and tart fruit. And then green and black tea, as you pointed out, are there to to serve a purpose. And the way I, I like to think about the tea is it's like the chaperone on the fruit party. You know what I mean? So without the tea, it's just juicy. You know, it, the, the apple and the pineapple and the citrus, they're delicious together, but it doesn't have structure. You need the tea to give structure. I, I, and man, I tried for nine months. It sounds like a very simple recipe and it is. Listen, it's, it is. But I tried for nine months combining different combinations of those ingredients as well as a litany of others that uh, eventually got dropped from the recipe. And there were recipes that I think were absolutely delicious. And I always tell people too, I stabilize Rockies with American neutral grain spirit. Uh, I tried using rum. I tried using agave distillates. I tried using gin, all sorts of stuff just for fun, some of them. And and because I, I honestly believe that it could work in others, brandy. I tried using white Armagnac, you know. So I'll tell you too, there are a couple of them that just to sip on their own, I kind of like better. You know what I'm saying? Like drinking those ingredients with a bit of tequila, it's delicious uh, as opposed to using a neutral spirit. But I, I, I said to myself, the the pure and simple fundamental core goal of this spirit is ultimate versatility. And if I use tequila to stabilize this, then it's going to be amazing with anything agave. It'll probably be delicious with a variety of other spirits, but it will be less natural, less delicious, less versatile with others. And uh, I had to do some soul searching and say to myself, I need to make sure that I'm walking the very fine line between clear deliciousness where it's it's greater than the sum of its parts and, and moving it into an area where it specializes too much. Right. And, and that, that took the better part of a year. And if you told me that it was going to take me a year to make something I'd made for eight years, I would have been like, you're crazy, but it's true. It did. The reason I picked these ingredients, uh, it was, it was born out in flavor to be clear, but 
I arrived at these, these original flavor uh, uh, components or these original ingredients by looking at the backs of labels in a grocery store. You know, if you look at the backs of labels in grocery stores at, at products that are delicious, you know, and, and the backs of juices and jams and jellies and any combination of, of dried fruits, fresh fruits, you know, uh, preserved fruits, etc., you see the same players consistently coming up. You see apple coming up a lot. You see citrus coming up a lot. And so I said to myself, if my goal is to be the most versatile spirit on the market, and if my goal is to be able to enhance, not be the star of the show, but rather to enhance someone's favorite spirit consistently, whether it's whiskey or wine or rum, etc., then I need to think about what, what ingredients, again, thinking of this from a culinary perspective, what ingredients already do a good job of that? And apple already does a good job of that. Citrus already does a good job of that. Oftentimes, pineapple does a really good job of that. So I'm like, that's what I should be concentrating on. And uh, kind of taking a, a page from the Ramos Gin Fizz, you know, you're using a split base of lemon and lime because you want both, both of those voices in the mix. And for that reason, I wanted to, to use a combination of citrus to ensure that I had that spectrum covered. There's a guy named Donnie Clutterbuck, uh, one of the most brilliant cocktail bartenders and people in general uh, that I've ever met. Um, he has a bar in uh, Rochester that everyone should go visit. And uh, the idea here, uh, the reason I bring it up is that he gives a citrus seminar that will blow anyone's mind. Um, you know, I, I attended the seminar at Rochester Cocktail Revival simply because he's my friend. And I, I thought, I'm going to go hang out with Donnie because Donnie's a cool guy. But the fact of the matter is, is that whenever I sat down for that for that seminar, I was completely blown away by the content and the depth that he was able to to speak to Citrus. So, face that down, uh, it's it's amazing stuff. Mm. And so the point is, a broad spectrum of of uh, expressions of Citrus. The same thing for the tea. I I've been making clarified milk punch long enough and drinks in general long enough to know that tea is a really good. Uh, backbone and and structure provider for for drinks. So I knew I wanted to include tea, and I, I cycled through all different kinds of tea, uh, and eventually said to myself, "It's not enough just to use black tea, because it's it's in the same way as the citrus, providing a great benefit uh, to many spirits, but not all. Same thing for green. Uh, I tried oolong as well, and I and I eventually landed on this equal combination of green and black that that gives." the versatility that comes with uh, both of those expressions of tea. Yeah. And this is getting us back to the essentials of what a cocktail is. A cocktail is just a balance of sweet, sour, boozy, and whatever the components of that cocktail format yeah. are. Um, a good cocktail, you know, is not all that complicated from a taste perspective, from a, a flavor perspective, which is where the broad spectrum broad mm. spectrum tea, broad spectrum citrus and tropical fruit. That's where those individual notes will play into the complexity of the flavor, but from a taste perspective, yeah, you don't you don't necessarily need to worry about like if it, you know, you, you don't need to titrate it to a micro, you know, nano level. It just needs to have some semblance of balance. So it seems right. like if we're talking about Rocky's botanical liqueur, not as a product to be enjoyed on its own, although it easily can be. And that's what I did last night. If we're talking about it as that utility player, like a vermouth or like a, you know, a sour mix, as you were mentioning earlier, it just needs to, you know, attain that balance. And, and I think to me, that's the real light bulb moment in this conversation is saying like, all right, we're taking milk punch and we're solving this problem that you encountered, which is the uh, like very weird, bizarre sort of navel gazy issue of people saying like, oh, well, it's milk punch. I need to make my own version of this. And we're solving that problem by saying like, but what if we just use milk punch in place of your, your sour and your sweet or in addition to another sour and another sweet, but you just dial back some of those ratios, which brings me to the cocktails that you list on your website and that you have on the um, the sort of shelf talkers that uh, are banded to the neck of your bottle. And my first reaction 
and this is probably not going to be a surprise to you, or it's probably happened before. My first reaction to these recipes is like, all right, this guy's got a martini recipe using milk punch. I'm like, I thought this guy was serious about cocktails. He's got to know that a martini doesn't have anything to do with milk punch. But then when I looked at it, I was like, oh, he's using the acid in the milk punch like the acid in the dry vermouth. That's right. And, you know, with that ratio, I mean, yeah, is, is this going to be like maybe a slightly sweeter, like maybe creamier version? I, you, you were mentioning a Vesper earlier and the Vesper is like a wonderful example of like a way to get milk punch into a martini format because you've got instead of the dry vermouth, you've got that uh, Lille, which is a little bit sweeter and, you know, a little bit more complex and it's got some bitterness in there where the tea might kind of come in and, and mimic that. So all of a sudden, like where, I, where when I first looked at these recipes, I'm like, he's got a martini, he's got a margarita, he's got like, he's got all these cocktails that really don't have anything to do with one another. Totally. And then when I looked at the recipes you were given, they didn't really resemble so much the recipes of these classic cocktails that I was familiar with, but they were a, a way to take your product as the utility player that it is and work it into that format, either in replacement of or in tandem with the other ingredients in that format. So I think, you know, really the art and the science behind the recipes that you're offering folks to me seems to be the decision of like, all right, are we doing in tandem with or at the exclusion of other ingredients in the recipe, primarily sweets and sours. Yep. Uh, and and what is the best expression of that ratio wise? Uh, and when you look at it that way, again, my initial kind of like sticker shock of being like, oh, that's not a martini was like, oh, but yeah, it is. So uh, I, I think it, it, having this conversation, you know, I'd already come to that conclusion after, you know, kind of playing around with the product. But having this conversation gives me a more full appreciation of those cocktails and of the Rockies Botanical Liqueur as a utility player, because I understand the work that resulted in that, if that makes any sense. It absolutely does. And uh, I appreciate you saying that so much, Eric. I, I really sincerely do. Because again, that that was the the gamble. That was the the bet uh, that I was making in the formulation process that I put the product through and taking the time to do it, taking the time to test it out on on strangers and friends alike, and uh, just believing in it, right? Uh, to to make the spirit with the exact level of acidity, the exact level of of sweetness, and the ratio of those ingredients, just so and testing out hundreds of different different iterations what i what i knew i wanted uh the product to do 95 percent of the time if not higher uh is that you could take an equal part of rockies with an equal part of anything else and stir it over ice give it a sip and be happy with the result you know and and that's not just base spirits although that's the the primary uh sort of litmus test for that you know, you can use you can use the same ratio ratio of Rockies and Montenegro Maro over ice, and it is mind blowingly good, right? So, if uh, there's one part of the process that took the most amount of time, uh, maybe second to selecting the ingredients, it was finding that that ratio of sweetness to acidity and and balance in the flavors. That was really, really, really important and time consuming and worth every second of it. Because you're right, you know, it it doesn't seem to make sense. If you look at it from a clarified product perspective, milk punch or otherwise, that you're you're going to use the same thing with uh, tequila or mezcal in a margarita as you are with Aperol in a spritz with Prosecco, as you will with gin or vodka in a martini, and as like a, a little splash of something fun in a swizzle tiki drink, you know? But that's what it does. That is what it does. And that's what I designed it to do. So uh, the, and the idea too, you know, I think that you're, that you are striking on uh, this, this concept of, is this a, uh, is this a replacement for something or an addition to something uh, to concentrate on the idea of the addition to something. If theoretically uh, the product Rockies is balanced in sweetness and acidity and, and intensity of flavor on its own, then theoretically, if you add it to a cocktail that is already also balanced, it should remain harmonious. Just if, by, by thinking about it that way, if both of them are harmonious independently of each other, the addition of one to the other should not throw either out of whack. 
right? And and that uh, again is it's something that took a lot of experimentation, a lot of playing around with. But I think it it's turned out real well. And there are a lot of bartenders uh, that that are making extraordinary cocktails that agree. You know, at, at PDT to 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 cite that bar uh, one more time because they were a very early adopter. Jeff and the team at PDT and he made a tea punch uh, using Agricole rum. Uh, Rockies, lime, and and if I'm not mistaken, oh man, uh, it's it's been been a while since I sipped one. Uh, thank you very much, pandemic. Um, but uh, but I think that there's a bit of falernum in there, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, the combination of those ingredients without Rockies is delicious and in balance. But you throw you throw the Rockies in there, and you have another dimension that you get from actual tea in your tea punch. And, and that bit of pineapple, that sort of roundness, richness of pineapple and apple, that brings a different dimension. And, and um, you know, I was, I was so, so, so happy to see that cocktail on their menu. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I look forward to drinking another one of those soon. It's just one of an infinite number of examples of, of that formulation uh, sort of proving out as, as uh, being in, in balance. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've learned so, so much over the course of this conversation. And I think the the last logical place that we need to go is to ask what's next for you? What's next for Rockies and and what's next for Amon? <laughs> well, um, I, I'm now working on uh, growing the production of, of Rockies. Um, I'm sm- still a very small craft team, you know, and in terms of getting out there and sharing the product with people, you're looking at the whole team. Uh, listening to the whole team, so so I'm I'm working really hard to get the word out, uh, get more people uh, familiar with the product, and to expand and in, into other markets so that this can be a real God's honest viable business. Um, and and I, I believe in it. You know, it's not an expensive product, uh, relatively speaking. You know, it costs a bar, oh, 16, 17 bucks, depending on the market that you're in. Not too crazy, and it usually hits a retail shelf for. 22 $23. So it's not price prohibitive. It's absolutely delicious. And, you know, the consequence of, uh, again, my, my sort of gamble in making the product affordable is that it's important to sell as much of it as possible for it to actually make sense. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a labor of love. Um, but I, I, I would also like to be able to continue to do this uh, as my life, as my career. Uh, so uh, just, just building the brand, growing the brand and expanding. That's, that is the name of the game right now. Well, that is an insane price point, especially if you think <laughs> about the fact that, you know, like if we're if we're if we're talking about Rockies as a modifier in modifier land, any any decent vermouth is going to cost you that much, if not, you know, five or five or ten bucks more. Easy. So um, that in and of itself, like that barrier, <laughs> it should should be a reason for anyone who's listening to go and and pick up a bottle. Um, what is the best way to uh, source Rockies in most American markets? Are you shipping direct to consumer? Uh, are there select uh, areas where you're distributed? How do we get a hold of a bottle? So all of the above. I, I want to preface my answer with uh, with just a um, statement of I, I think what is now relatively um, uh, common knowledge that from a supply chain perspective, and I and I hate to use that phrase that's been that's been broadcast so many times over the airwaves uh, over the last uh, several months. But, you know, getting bottles to, to fill has been really, really hard, like next to impossible. So with that said, all of the stores that I work with are on my website, rockieslicure.com. Uh, that's R-O-C-K-E-Y-S-L-I-Q-U-E-U-R.com. Uh, just make sure to throw that E into Rockies. So all the all the stores I work with, uh, theoretically, and bars as well, and restaurants for that matter, are on my website. Um, there are shipping options available. There are a few states that um, you know it's it's difficult, more difficult to ship to. Um, but for the most part, we cover all of them. I would just say if you're in uh, a region that has a store that that carries Rockies, give them a call ahead of time to make sure that they've been able to maintain inventory um, because it has been tough to get. Uh, tough to get every store all the bottles that that we want, uh, just because it's been tough to get a hold of the glass to to make the product. Uh, but that's turning around, luckily now, and and it looks like we're gonna we're gonna be in good shape uh, in the very very near future. So not to worry long term, but I don't want anybody to take a drive to a store and then have them not find the product. Yeah, for sure. That said, one of the best ways to stay in touch is to go to Rocky's Liqueur or at Rocky's Liqueur 
on Instagram. Uh, we're very responsive and, and we'll make sure that uh, if you have a question about the brand or if you want to find a bottle or, or just chit chat about something that maybe you heard on this, uh, on this podcast, um, we will absolutely be in touch for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, we will have links to all that over on the show notes page at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. So if you, uh, want to, uh, just click a few links and explore everything that Rocky's liqueur has to offer. Uh, we'll give you the opportunity to do that and can confirm on the responsiveness of the Instagram. That's how we got in touch. Um, <laughs> so Eamon, is there anything that, uh, we forgot to mention that you want to make sure that our listeners, uh, know before we jump off today? Oh gosh. Uh, we, we covered so much and, and I'm, I'm truly grateful. Uh, honestly, this has been a real pleasure. Um, and, and I feel like these, these sorts of uh, democratizations of, of inside baseball in such a fun and exciting way. Um, there should be more of this. So mm. I, I'm truly, truly appreciative. Um, I, I guess the, the last thing I'll say is that I'm grateful to anybody who's been able to last an hour and a half and listening to uh, whatever I whatever I have to say. Uh, it's it's really a pleasure. And I can't say that I've been more proud of, of any work that I've ever done to date. So if there's anything that I can do to contribute um, myself or Rockies to to your lives um, as as listeners, please don't hesitate to reach out. It'd be an absolute pleasure. Awesome. Well, Eamon, thanks once again for being a guest here on the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here. And by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed, Milk Punch and Flavor Insights courtesy of Eamon Rocky, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2021.